thank you guys for inviting me here today. Uh, I think they pointed out I'm from Emporia, Kansas. For anybody that's familiar with Kansas, I'm about halfway between Topeka and Wichita. Uh, we live in a 32-inch rain environment. Well, that's our average. In 09, we had 52, and this year we had less than 20. We rarely seem to hit our average. So uh, we have silty loam soils, uh, for the most part a little bit of clay. And uh, my presentation today is going to be about soil health and kind of the journey I took to get to where I am today. Uh, can everybody hear me okay in the back and all around? Okay. Uh, we'll start off by rising in the morning, torn between a desire to improve the world and a desire to enjoy the world makes it kind of hard to plan the day. Uh, Kansas, we're really famous for our sunrises and sunsets. As we drove in last night, we noticed you guys have pretty gorgeous sunsets too. In fact, we had to stop on Interstate 94 so we could to take a couple of photos. Soil health, your bottom line, dollars and cents. As you can see, I spell cents a little different than most people. Uh, as I go through my presentation today and I talk about things I've done in my farm, I could give you uh, numbers and figures of dollars that I've saved or spent on my farm, but really, what good does that do to you? So as I go through here today, I just assume you mark down what that might mean to you on your operation to your banker in both dollars and in cents. But at the end of the day, that, that's who it's most important to is uh, how it affects you and your bottom line. When I put this presentation together about a year ago, I googled soil health images, and this is what I come up with. Surprise, surprise. <laughs> For you, those of you that don't know, this is your Canadian neighbor, Mr. Neil Dennis, one of the top grazers on the planet. If you all know these two here, Gabe Brown and our host, Mr. Fuhrer, who, by the way, I understand has a little celebration going on today at some point or this evening. We're not going to discuss a number, just that maybe today is Jay's birthday, so you guys all give him a handshake later on. I'm sure he will be getting even with somebody later on today. Uh, again, when I put this presentation together, I, I put this up with my motto, where we feed billions daily. I didn't take long in hanging around people like Dr. Chris Nichols, Dr. Joe Clark, and they understand that this number is way too low. So this year I put my motto under construction, we're going to change it to trillions, until I heard Dr. Nichols this fall at the No-Till in the Plains Soil Health webinar, and I now have a new number that I can't even pronounce. Uh, mammalians, I believe, is that correct, Jay? Am I close? And for those of you that don't know what a mammalian is, a lot of zeros. Uh, it's about what Gabe makes in a couple of years of the way he farms <laughs> uh, Never heard of a million, it was a thousand times a billion times a billion times a billion. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm in Emporia, Kansas. Uh, my house is about 100 yards off the bank of the beautiful Neosho River. Uh, a very gorgeous setting, 99% uh, of the time. As I mentioned, in, in a heavy rain environment, every once in a while, this is the view off my back step. And you would think that after living here for 20 plus years and living my whole life within a mile or so of this river, we would know this is going to happen and be prepared for it. But no, we have to let her prove it over and over that she's going to do this, and this is how we spend our mornings when she is racing towards our house. Uh, my nephews, they even jump in and help guide the trucks in and out so they know where the ditches are, so they don't run off and that actually is the county road they're sitting on in the hay. Uh, this is the view from that same place as the river started to recede is actually over that fence of the crest. So uh, we deal with soil health in a little different way. We use cover crops usually to get rid of moisture, or you guys use them to pull moisture. But we also are very, very dry in the late summer, so we're using them to wick moisture in the spring and then grow residue so that we can save moisture for, this, for the late summer. We're not dodging floods, we're dodging these. Uh, I'm sorry for the quality of this picture, but when you're right underneath a tornado until you stay underneath one and take a picture, we'll see if you guys can hold the camera any more still than I can. Uh, this tornado was actually for this spring, and it actually came over our farm. This is taken from my backyard. Our farm is uh, just about a mile straight north, and it came over our farm in that position and did damage to about five buildings. Uh, if you guys watch the news much, you may be familiar with this one. It actually became an F3 killer a few minutes later when it pretty well destroyed the town of Reading, Kansas. So, uh, something else we have to live with in our area. 
And also for you guys that are dry climate, you might not be familiar, this is how we get from field to field from time to time. This is crick crossings we have to use to, uh, to get our equipment from one field to another. Something we deal with in a low higher rain environment. Soil health. When you look at this log here, what do you see? Life or death? This is life, this is the beginning of new soil. As the tree falls and rots and the fungi take over and decompose and over years and years we start to build new soil. Up until four or five years ago, I thought this was the only way we could build soil. But after hanging around guys like Mr. Fuhrer and Josh and Gabe and Joe Clapperton and Brian Lindley, we're starting to learn through cover crops, we can build this process much faster. I didn't realize until last night when I was visiting with Colin Sice, who's in the back here, going to be in this lineup next week from Australia. Uh, Colin has grown, was it one meter of soil, Colin? In 20 years in Australia. We can build soil, or some people can build soil very fast. And we all need to get there because we've degraded it way too much. So why soil health? What does soil health mean? And to different producers, it means different things. To Duane Beck at Dakota Lakes Research Farm, which I'm sure you guys are all familiar with Duane at Pierre, it means growing corn 21 consecutive years stacked on top of each other. This is not double stack, triple stack, refuge in a bag. This is conventional corn on conventional corn on conventional corn. He has no corn rootworm issues, no corn borer issues, no insect issues of any kind. His soil health is so good, as you can see, no problems with the corn. Even the university began to doubt his data to the point that a few years ago they brought in a third party consultant who planted several thousand rootworms per foot row of corn and could not get any damage out of the corn. They went, then went out and set traps and they counted over a billion predators per acre. That's what soil health means to Dwayne at, at Pierre, South Dakota. What does soil health mean to Gabe Brown here at Bismarck? It means growing 125 bushel of corn in a 16 inch grain environment with no commercial fertility for four or five years in a row. And as you guys all are familiar with the Minokin farm, what does soil health mean here? And I was fortunate enough to be up here a year ago and tour this farm. And I knew we could, we could really improve the system. I had no idea how fast we could do it until I came and seen this. One of the worst farms in the county. Uh, and in two years time, they grow 122 bushel corn with no fertility in the second year. Uh, they, I believe, this is kind of tough to do this in front of the guys right here. I got my facts right here. Uh, if I remember right, you had a pea crop to begin with that failed and was rolled down, and then a summer mixed cover crop planted and rolled it down, and then planted corn in year two with no fertility. And we were here over Labor Day, and they have bare soil. I was absolutely shocked how fast they got this system going and how, how little residue they had. Uh, that's just simply amazing. Uh, Rolf and I have a few similar quotes and slides in here, so we'll blow through some of these pretty fast. A uh, nation that destroys its soil destroys itself. Uh, we've seen that in other continents for some reason we don't want to learn or follow. Uh, and as you guys in North Dakota know, it's not so much water erosion as it is wind erosion. Uh, I know the Dust Bowl may have been in the 30s, but this photo was taken a couple years ago in Oklahoma. In the U.S., on average, 5.5 tons of soil per acre per year is lost to erosion. Interesting that Rolf mentioned that the USDA accepts 5 tons of soil per acre per year as standard operating. That's exactly what we're doing, 5.5. Uh, this photo here was taken just west of the Kansas-Colorado border on Interstate 70 a couple years ago. I think it was three people were killed in that accident in the dust storm. This is a photo of sediment flowing out of the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. Irresponsibility. No single raindrop believes it's to blame for the flood. So unfortunately, nobody in here is going to say it's their fault that the, the uh, Gulf of Mexico is filling full of dirt or any of the other problems we have. The sandstorms are caused by us, but it is our fault. We all need to be responsible. We all need to look in the mirror because I think we all can know that we look in the mirror and we, we know we can do better. We know we can improve. And who's going to pay for this erosion? In a, just over 100 years since we start, first started plowing the prairie, we've lost almost 40% of our topsoil. Uh, my grandkids will not have anything to farm if we don't change what we're doing. Who's going to pay for this? 
I'm not going to pay for it. I'm going to be able to survive. And you know my banker, she's not going to pay for it. She'll pass the buck on to somebody else. This is who going to, who's going to pay for my stupidity. It's my son Colby, my daughter Kelsey, my next daughter Erica, and son Lucas. I love my kids too much, so we're going to change the way we do things. My kids will not pay for, for the acts that we've done in the past. So the buck stops here, the buck stops now, and the buck stops with me. We now no longer allow erosion on our operation. We want to start to build soil and try to get the planet back to where it was when it started. So in 1995, we switched to 100% no-till, problem solved, right? Uh, in Kansas, NRCS numbers show that in a, most no-till situations, about a half a ton of soil per acre per year lost erosion. Now that might be better than 5.5 ton. That is a totally unacceptable number, period. That's still a negative number. Uh, by the way, as you can see, this is fairly flat ground here where this happened, but lack of cover. Same farm, quarter mile away, same day, a lot more slope. Corn pinted into a cover crop, no erosion. Don't find fault, find a remedy. Uh, this is the same farm. I ran this farm four or five years ago. Uh, it had been plowed this to death, had a huge wheat problem, a poor fertility problem. We began fixing terraces, which for those of you that don't know what a terrace is, come to eastern Kansas, you can learn to hate them with the rest of us. Uh, all the terraces were washed out. We fixed one field per year. In the meantime, uh, this particular field here, I had some leftover seed wheat. We blew on about 20 pounds of the acre in the fall. It didn't come up until spring. We had our wettest spring on record in 2009. And yet, look at this terrace where it washed out. What I did was just a little bit of cover on it. The bottom was starting to hold, and starting to fill in, and rebuild itself. And we have done this time and time again, just with roots and plants and cattle, letting them do the work for us. So now we've started to talk about erosion problem with cover crops, and that was really the whole goal of what we introduced cover crops for. But we found out in our journey that that was just the first of many, many things that cover crops do for us. Uh, as I mentioned, we had a huge wheat control issue on this farm. Uh, this is the same field you looked at earlier with the wheat cover crop. This is much later in the summer. Uh, this field had a crunch syndrome on it when I rented it. The cover burr seed were three inches deep on it the first year I walked across it. As you can see here, we have one little weed finally poked through in the summer. So what would at least one less herbicide pass be worth to you, both in dollars and in cents? And I'm sure you guys have been around Dr. Nichols enough. You've seen this slide before, so we won't spend much time on it. But uh, all of our cover crops are cocktail mixes where we have grasses and legumes and brassicas, and they can transfer your nutrients back and forth, nutrient cycling, I'm finding it a huge, huge part of our farming operation. Thanks to the cover crops, we are actually now starting to cut back on our fertility program. I hope to continue to do some more so in the future. And this is another one you've probably seen before. In the past, we all thought that alfalfa and uh, manure were about the best ways we could improve our soil. The CN ratios of those two, but look at the CN ratios of our bacteria or soil organic matter. And this is how, how we recycle our nutrients. Water infiltration at the Rogers Memorial Research Farm at the University of Nebraska. For those of you that have never been there, it's a beautiful farm to view. This farm is donated to the University of Nebraska to do conservation research. Uh, this is Paul Yasa. He runs the farm. Uh, this farm is pretty sloping. There's quite a hill that comes down here across this bean field into this creek. And if you look back here behind Paul, you can see some flags the university didn't believe Paul and his water infiltration that he was telling them about, so they brought these down and put in water gathering stations in each one of these flags. After three years, they abandoned the project. They had yet to gather water in any of them. <laughs> the day we were there, it rained all night. Uh, it, we got there about 10 o'clock in the morning. It was still raining. Paul had over three inches of rain. This photo was taken about an hour later. And as Roth said, you could walk out there in your Sunday shoes. You don't see mud anywhere on anybody's pant leg. Incredible infiltration at this farm. Soil temperature, Roth mentioned this one as well. Very, very important. This picture comes from Steve Groff in Pennsylvania this year. He was hot also. Uh, the picture here on the upper left was the coin growing in the cover crop residue. Temperature is just above 80 degrees and the bare soil is 100. And as Roth pointed out, 
you get up into this area, we start to kill our bacteria. In this area, they start to go dormant. And also, we're only using 15% of our moisture when we lose the rest to evaporation, transpiration. We can keep the temperature down in the 70s. 100% of our moisture is used for growth. I think the U.S. that can be very important. And this is what we're after. Soil health leads to plant health. This is double crop corn on my farm. This is the first year we attempted double crop corn. This was planted on May 25th, which for us, corn is planted on April 1st. Our last day for crop insurance is May 25th. Uh, we really thought we were knocking it out of the park on our first attempt. But if you notice what Manette is standing on here, it's bare soil. This corn is taken after an oak pea cover crop. And fortunately, in the early years, we were harshening our cover crops. This here was chopped for haylage. It did increase a little money flow for us early on. But uh, we were going backwards with our soil health, and we have since changed the way we harvest our cover crops, and we'll talk about that in a little bit. Failure is simply the opportunity to begin again, this time more intelligently. Uh, for those of you that have not been over to Kenny's Ranch across the river, uh, when we toured there last year, this was just absolutely incredible to me. This is Kenny's Bromfield, for those of you that have not been there. Uh, Kenny's forefathers broke this. When they broke the prairie, they tried to farm this. Uh, and, and, and this is a great story for me being in Kansas, because when, when I give my presentation, and the first thing I hear is, well, those guys in North Dakota, you know, we can't do that. They have this soil, and they, they have more sunlight, and they have this, and they have that. Well, yeah, Gabe does have some very nice soil, and I, I would love to have some soil like Gabe has. But as you guys most know, when you cross the river to Kenny's side, it's a little different soil. Uh, this is the soil there where we were at. It's almost all bent night clay. And I pretty well shut the guys up pretty fast and say, you know, they can keep it. I'll take what I have. But anyway, back to uh, this brome field here behind Kenny. Uh, they sowed it back down to brome. They couldn't get it to any production out of farming. Uh, couldn't get any production out of hay. Uh, they tried grazing it, hanging it. Finally, uh, I think Kenny's wanting to reestablish the brome, and so they, they sprayed it out, they planted a warm season mix, mob grazed it, and after two or three years, lo and behold, the brome not only was still there, but we had become very productive, and I believe in the third year actually produced seed for the first time. Um, and I think Kenny told me he did apply some fertility to it the first year, and then after that, it was just whatever the cows put to it. But, uh, just incredible what you can do with just a little bit of thinking outside the box. Uh, about a year and a half ago, Brian Lindley, the director of No-Till and Plains, called me and asked me if I would host a, his summer whirlwind expo on my farm. I said, sure. And he goes, well, what do you want to talk about since you're the host? I said, well, I guess you've had me talking at your conferences about soil health. Never really have put my farm to the test. Maybe it's time for me to sit down and shut up. And maybe it's time to find out where we're at. So he set up a program and I was just completely wild by it. Uh, you guys probably recognize this. He brought down Dr. Chris Nichols. Not only that, he brought in Dr. Jill Clapperton. I had the two top soil microbiologists on the planet in one pit on one day. We had fun. Uh, Kenny was there, and uh, Kenny will attest. It had, you know, for, for my South American friends and my Australian friends, as miserable as they are here today, Chris was this miserable here that day. 90 plus degrees, it rained that morning, humidity was over 70%, we're in the middle of a cornfield with no air. I thought we were around to carry him out on a stretcher, and the producers would not leave. Chris and Jill were in this pit over three hours, and uh, we found all kinds of critters and bugs. Uh, was it all good? No, not exactly. Found compaction layers, and we measured them out, and best guess, this was from a very wet harvest in the fall of 1986. The compaction is still there. That would, there would have been 15 years of very intensive tillage following this. If that was what that was caused by, there would have been at least three deep rippings included in that, those tillage years, and then 15 years of very intense no-till. Uh, we pushed this ground harder than anything. We've had alcohol on it for five years, and yet the compaction is still there. Now, as you can see, the roots are coming through it. We, we, we're getting it broken up, but it's still there. And in 2009, we did the same thing in my county. Almost every acre of conventional till was rutted during harvest. 
and all my neighbors brag about how fast and how good they got it fixed with their inline rippers, their chisel files, and everything else. And this would show that they're all probably lying to us. Uh, one of the other things we found in the pit, though, on the good side, uh, Joe Clapperton found a native bird form. And we found several of them. And uh, it was the first time Jill had ever found a native earthworm in a cropping situation in North America. The only time she found in previous was in native or in timber. So that tells us that we are getting very close with this soil here, uh, getting it back to where Mother Nature had it to begin with. And for me, that is the answer. And, and you guys have seen this slide as well. I stole this from Jay. And the answer is to imitate the native rangeland. Mother Nature's right, and we're wrong. And the only way we're going to succeed is to follow what she does. And we, we've been fighting with her for long enough, and she will win. I think she's probably proven that to everybody in this room. So we now have become much more diverse in our cropping operation. This is what we grew on our farm last year. I think there's 67 different species here. Grasses, brassicas, medoos, broadleafs, warm season, cool season. Uh, anything we can. Last year we added vegetables and flowers into our companion crops. Uh, the, the vegetables, we also added pumpkins, but we didn't have any luck with them. Uh, the, they're used for warming purposes for our cattle operation. These are for attracting beneficial insects, pollinators. Also, if you notice, we've got some perennials we're also including in our cover crops now, using more perennials in our cover crops and our companions. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, we use cocktail mixes. Why? Uh, I can't tell you why. That's for Dr. Nichols and people a lot smarter than me. All I can tell you is it works. Uh, this is spring barley planted in our plot in the fall a year ago. You can see just above Lynette's ankle. Move over 10 feet. Plant in the mix. Why? I have no clue. All I know is it works. They tell me there's all these things going underneath the soil I can't see. I gotta believe they're right. Um, our cash crops now, uh, when we started no-till, we were in a corn and soybean rotation and 70 to 80% of the corn was chopped for silage. No residue, no carbon, no cover. Uh, I almost quit no-till in the early 2000s because we were going backwards. When we finally, I was convinced to introduce wheat into the, into the rotation. And from there, we've just been straight up. And today, um, this year, we're looking at 12 or 13 cash crops in our operation. Corn, soybeans, White clover, sunflowers, which are a double crop behind the cereal, winter wheat, field peas, hairy vetch, triticale, Austrian winter pea, forage oats, forage peas, rye. Uh, this year we're introducing winter barley, winter canola, winter triticale. Uh, we're also going to reintroduce grain sorting this summer, cow peas, mung beans and sapphire. How do we have time, Josh? Okay, I think we'll just skip this thing. Uh, we, there was about a five minute video we were going to watch on, on uh, monocultures and, and why, why not monocultures, but I think for time we're just going to go on and uh, we'll show you why we're getting away from monocultures in our operation. Uh, one way we're getting away from monocultures is we're starting to plant companions. Basically, we're letting our cover crops either live while the cash crop is planted, or we're planting a, a companion after we plant the cash crop. And some of the things we've used, subterranean clover, and uh, we've had lots of failures in lots of other areas, but we just view them as learning opportunities. Here you can see we didn't get it thick enough, but we were very impressed as it reseeded itself and did over winter for us, acting more like a perennial. Why are we using companions? We want more of these. And more of these. Uh, we've cut back, we've not used insecticide for two years. I'm not going to say we're never going to use it again, but it's definitely at the bottom of our toolbox. We don't want to use insecticide, we don't want to use fungicide, and uh, those just hamper these. The companion crops are going to do uh, help pull these in and also maybe help reestablish our, our failing quail population. Uh, in the background here is a forage oat forage pea mix. 
In the foreground here, this is the, the Trinity Paley Harry Betts Winter P. This is our first attempt at this crop. We've been growing this one for quite a while. As I've mentioned, we were harvesting it for hay and for haylage. Uh, we wanted to get a little more diverse, and so we, we got a three-way mix here. Uh, it was our first attempt at, at overwintering a uh, triticated crop like this. Uh, 09, the very wet year that we had, it was December 10th, and we still didn't have a planted. I called Gabe and said, what do I do now? He goes, can you plant today? And I said, yeah. He goes, do you have moisture? I said, yeah, we have moisture. He goes, we'll plant it, see what happens. So we planted it on December 10th. This is what we had, the 40 goats, 40 HPs. We planted on uh, the end of February, early March. And as you can see, they're just pretty well kicking some butt right here. We tried reseeding some 40 jokes in here. It didn't help. Uh, we thought about picking this crop out, and just going into a cash crop. But as Wayne Gretzky says, uh, you'll always miss 100% of the shots you don't take. Sometimes you just need to be a little patient. This is what we harvested. We may have five ton of forage come off of this. We interceded part, interceded part of this with clovers. Here's what it looked like after we mowed it. We were waiting for it to dry to bail it. The clover is already back up, poked through the residue, uh, keeping the ground covered at all times. After we were harvesting our, our forage crop, we come in and double crop corn. Uh, as I said, the, the window for corn planting in our county is April 1st to May 25th. Uh, the last six years, my best corn has been planted after May 25th. Next year, all of our corn will be planted after May 25th. That's too many coincidences in a row. Uh, when I was talking to Joe Clapperton about this last year, when he was in the soil pit, and I said, you know, you know, what's going on here? And she goes, well, duh, corn's a warm season grass. Why are you planting on April 1st? Well, my neighbors are planting on April 1st, and I got to keep up with them. So, but if I'm out yielding my April 1st corn, why am I doing it? So here we've harvested, we've got corn already coming up, and when you plant corn in June in Kansas, it goes fast. Uh, this is the corn here where we had the clover interceded with it. This is the corn in four weeks. Normally corn in four weeks in our area is well under knee high. This is corn in 53 days. We're already past black layer. Uh, this corn made 145 bushel the acre as a double crop. Uh, this was the forage oats, forage peas on the other side. We uh, chopped them for haylage. It was June 22nd before we finally got dry enough to chop them. And this is what it looked like when the choppers left. I found out what my residue managers on my planter were for. It took me about 10 years. They did a nice job of knocking these down. I knew they were for something, but I didn't know until that day exactly what they were for. We went in and planted beans, 50 bushel double crop beans. Uh, we harvested the corn late October and planted our third crop that year in that field. That's the first for me, three crops in one year. Uh, this was a, a uh, cereal rye, Austrian winter pea, winter canola cover crop. This is what it looked like on April 22nd when my neighbors were bagging their, backing their corn planters in the barn. This is what it looked like on May 6th when we planted the corn into it. And we planted a companion crop the same day into the corn. It was a, uh, we thought we really had it finally figured out. This was a grouse of radish. And there was some plantain, some white clover. We mixed in some crimson clover, sub clover, cosmos, marigolds, and uh, bachelor buttons, and hairy vetch, a few other things. Uh, we had several hailstorms this year. The corn kind of got beat up. One thing we did find out, paraquat will not kill rye. Uh, the corn did not like rye standing next to it. Um, Jill was at my farm this summer, and she, we, you know, we were just astounded because as you could walk out, if there was a rye touching the corn plant, the corn just looked like crap. And she goes, you know, you think plants don't have feelings? Plant rye next to corn, you'll find out. She goes, the rye's not hurting it; corn just hates it. And it was, and the corn right next to it would be doing just fine. As you can imagine, I'm pretty popular at the coffee shop in Florida. <laughs> and uh, going through a divorce a few years ago, I've learned not to worry too much about rumors. They're carried by haters, spread by fools, and accepted by ignorance. So one thing I've learned to do on my operation work where I live, I live on a dead end road coming down to the river, and that's where I started doing a lot of my playing. I now do most of it on the highway. Because the, the traffic on that dead end road, I like my peace and quiet, and, and 
really hard for my neighbors to be inconspicuous to drive down and look at what I was doing on the way to the coffee shop. So I put it on the highway now. It's real easy for them right on the way in and kind of see what I'm doing. Uh, this was the companion crop late June, June 29th. The heat was on at this point in time. Uh, if you guys that don't know him, this is Ray Archuleta. He came down to visit me the next day. Uh, he leads the soil health team for NRCS. This is a very, very difficult picture for me to look at because on this date, on June 30th, this is the same field that had the companions underneath it. Uh, we had 750 acres of corn and we had our best corn crop ever. We were thinking 150 to 200 bushel. We've never raised 200 bushel corn before. We thought we were going to do it right here. Uh, we thought rough plain corn was going to be 100 to 150 bushel on June 30th. And uh, here's a picture of Ray. If you guys know Ray, you know why this picture is wobbly. You can't get him to hold still long enough to take a picture. <laughs> but this is some soil we dug between the rows. And just if it's a better picture, you just see thousands and thousands of earthworm holes. You can see all the roots from the companions. But here a month later, Corn's pretty well dead. The companions did well. Uh, I was a little disappointed. I, I thought the radishes were going to come up, get a quick canopy for my clovers and things, and then die out. The radishes didn't even know it was a drought. Uh, they took the heat in the summer very well. The corn is now dead. Uh, the surprising thing, our cool season crops down here, although they're not doing well, they're alive. We had almost 40 days of 100 degree temperatures this summer. And for clover and hairy vetch and plantain to be alive, uh, that was a miracle for me. We, we, it was a failure, but we learned an awful lot. Uh, this is after we harvested the corn. As you can see, there's the radishes. And they're still alive today. They don't like cold, they're still alive today. Uh, unbelievable. Uh, the way things change and the soil health improves. The bachelor buttons, we never even seen them this summer until we harvested the corn, and all of a sudden they showed up and just exploded. And the miracles were there all year, and they were still here middle of October blooming. I think they reseeded will probably be there next year for next year's crop. Intensity, diversity, above ground and below ground. That's, that's what we've got to get. Intensity in your crops, leaf, uh, grasses, broad leaves, legumes, tall plants, short plants, metal plants, deep roots, shallow roots, medium roots, all growing together, just like Mother Nature intended. If Mother Nature did it, we need to do it. Uh, we, we talk, I talked a little bit about monocultures and why nowhere in nature we ever find a monoculture. Why are we doing monocultures? We can't beat Mother Nature. We have to join her. How do I plant? Uh, this is my famous drill. I hope there's no crowd viewers in the room because this is a, the biggest POS you'll ever see. Uh, this is a 1976 model. As I mentioned, I've been through a divorce. This is what I can afford. Uh, the serial number on this grill is a one. <laughs> but it does the job. Is it what I want? No. But it does the job and that's all that matters. Uh, this is my planter. I do have a little nicer planter. This is us planting our corn this year on June 5th into a veg pea cover crop. This was the only corn we harvested this year. Made 25 bushel the acre. The rest of the corn either chopped grazed, paid, and about a fourth of the, the corn wasn't even harvested. This is just a picture of the planter. This is the only attachment I have in my planter, the Thompson closing wheels. We've thrown everything else away. This is the corn coming up through the stubble. So uh, this is a kind of a poor picture. This is the triticale mix that we were baling earlier. And as the sun sets, on this day of making hay, it also sets on the way we harvest our cover crops. No more are we going to mechanically harvest our cover crops. Uh, our organic matter where we're harvesting cover crops is flatlining at best. Where we are not, our organic matter is skyrocketing. Uh, I went to the, well, I go to the No-Till and Queens Winter Conference almost every year, and about eight years ago, Dwayne Beck, who's a often speaks there, and I'm sure you guys have all heard Dwayne, and you know, if you want to know where you stand in the world, just ask Dwayne. <laughs> Dwayne got up in front of 1,200 producers and said, farmers are the dumbest people I know. I said, well, I've heard Dwayne before, but that takes a little bit. He says, you guys spend all summer baling hay. You spend all fall hauling hay to the farm. You spend all winter hauling hay to the cows. It's usually either knee-deep mud or blowing sand. 
and you spend all spring hauling the hay back to the field. He says, idiots, they're portable. They have legs, take them to the forage. Well, I don't live in Missouri, but I'm pretty close. I had to think about it a while and I had to show it. So, you know, we went on and thought about it for a couple of years. But in 2004, we, we had started playing with cover crops in the late 90s, and then we had a drought in 2000, and 2001, and 2002, and we had to cut back, and we cut back on cover crops, unfortunately. Uh, but in 2004, I realized then, as my organic manner, manner was plummeting and my erosion was skyrocketing, that we needed to get back to them. And we went back, we went back with the cocktail mixes, and it didn't take long to realize this was a pretty good forage. And so we did start grazing on about 20 acres in 2004. And at that time, I was doing what I called intensive rotational grazing. We were moving the cattle every day, to every week or two. And we had 20-some cows on 20-some acres in one field and about 50 acres in another field. And then I went and visited Kenny Miller and Gabe Brown, and I'm no longer an intensive rotational grazer, I'm a conventional grazer. About 10 minutes, okay. Uh, so we went home and we, we changed our grazing operation. We set up some reels and we went to moving the cattle much more often. Uh, this was the first weekend after harvest in 2010. This is the only perennial, true perennial, I have in my operation, this is 15 acres of a, a seven way fescue mix. And uh, as I mentioned, this was our first weekend after harvest. Nobody wanted to come babysit the cows all weekend. So we set this nine acre paddock up and moved the cows once a day through it. And we estimated it was about four and a half ton of forage available for the cows. And lo and behold, it, it lasted my cows three days. We came back to work on Monday and we moved them across into a four acre paddock. It was the same mix. And it had not been great yet this fall. There was the exact same forage in it. We thought about four and a half tons. And we set up and we moved the cows three times a day through the four acre field. And it lasted nine days. It didn't take me long to show me, you know, the, the value of mob grazing. So what did that mean? Now we'll get into that a bit later. I'll show you what it did this year. Uh, this is just a picture of the cows going through. This is how we move our cows. Uh, this is a... Uh, digital solar powered timer that Neil Dennis found in New Zealand. Uh, you set this timer for 9 o'clock, at 8.59 a little buzzer goes off. If you're in the back room, you won't hear it. The cows hear it. At 9 o'clock, they're standing at the gate, the gate comes open, the cows move themselves. Uh, now, I, as I mentioned, we've been moving my cows before, so they had some idea of what a reel was. They kind of knew what it meant to go through a small gate, but still, they had never done this before. It took them three days to learn this. In three days time, we no longer had to go and push them through. They moved themselves from that point on. This is just a picture of the gate coming open. There's nobody pushing these cows, going through, going to work. So in 2010, or 2011, this is the four acre paddock. This had been grazed twice by June 15th, and this is what it looked like. This is the, the nine acre paddock across the fence after it had been grazed twice. We increased production after one mob grazing, we increased our production the next year 50%. Now that's one year data, that's not scientific data, that's just what I see in one year. Next year we might have a complete disaster, but I don't think so. Um, this four acre field is not produced all year long this year, the nine acre field, and I, I know we'll do the same again next year. Uh, after we got done mob grazing that last fall, we had a sedan, it was a summer mix, it kind of got our grasses a little too thick in, it was it was uh, more millets and sedans than it was sunflowers and veg and peas. And uh, we winter grazed it. We turned the cows in on December 22nd. Uh, we had 66 beef units on this 10 acre field. It lasted 55 days. And once the snow hit, as you can see, the forage kind of went down. The cows had no problem going down to get it. Uh, excellent manure distribution behind it. And I know this isn't snow in North Dakota, but in Kansas, this is as good as it gets. This was the biggest one day snowfall ever. Last February, 14 inches in 24 hours. I'm oh, sorry, I know I can't hold a candle to you guys, but we were pretty impressed. Uh, we did not put out any hay for these girls. They grazed through it. I'm sure my neighbors want to report me to somebody, but as you can see, they're pretty fat and happy. They know how to work. This was the next morning. And the more speaking I do, the more photogenic my cows get, and they fight over shots of who gets their picture taken next. <laughs> as you can see, there's uh, no issues here with condition on the girls. In fact, when we got done, I was afraid they were almost too fat to calve. Uh, 
we got done. This was for winter grade. We went to a forage oak, forage pea mix on this this spring. It was going to be for seed purposes. And we had about eight to ten ton of forage on this when we started grazing it. We grazed half or less. We trampled the rest of it into the soil. April 8th, we got bare spots out there bigger than your table. Unreal how fast the, the system kicks in once you get it alive. Value of manure where we winter grazed. Uh, these are NRCS numbers, 70 pounds of manure per beef unit. We had 56 head, which constituted 66 beef units, 4,620 pounds a day, six days per acre, 13.86 ton of manure. As Dwayne said, why do you haul the hay to the cows and then haul it back? The cows did it all for me. What would that cost? Just the, the, just the hauling alone and fuel and labor and equipment to haul all that to your field. And 90% of what goes in the front end of a cow comes out the back and is all available almost immediately. Increase in organic matter, time will tell. Value of the urine, I couldn't even find statistics on it. But we all know there's a lot of value in the urine as well. Cost of the hay that we didn't have to haul to the cows, didn't have to bale, didn't have to put out. Cost of manure. When we got done winter grazing, we weren't quite to spring yet. Uh, we had done a little bit of bell grazing the year before. And so then we set up last year and finished the winter out doing some bell grazing. Uh, this is outstanding for me because the option here for the cows is that they're doing here or this, which is across the fence. And this is part of our problem today. You know, it's not just farming that needs to be fixed. We, we all got a lot of things. Um, the video, when they talked about uh, monocultures, and they also talked about uh, the dead zone in the Gulf and some things like that. My son graduated K-State a couple years ago. He moved to Kansas City, lived a couple years. He's in the landscape business. Um, he's also big in the restaurant business. And living in downtown Kansas City, it was scary to go visit my son. Um, you walk down the streets in a city, more and more people are asking where their food are coming from. And they have the right to ask that. And we aren't ready to answer. If you guys left here today, and you're driving your driveway, and you get home, and CNN is sitting in your yard, say, hi, I'm Joe Blow from CNN, and I want to do a documentary on where our food comes from. You want to show me around? How many guys are ready? I'm not. You know, there, there's too many things like this still going on. We've got to get fixed because America's coming and they want to know. We've got, we got to change some things. And by the way, in my defense, uh, my neighbor ran my feedlot. These, these weren't mine. <laughs> <laughs> we, uh, we have a thousand head backgrounding lot and uh, we are in the process of converting everything to grazing. But in the meantime, he offered to rent it and I needed a little cash flow to help build the fence. So couple of years he ran a lot to, to help me with some cash flow issues. So. Uh, we also uh, mob grazed some feeders, some stockers this year. Uh, this was them running on a uh, rye to the Kaylee, about an eight or nine month mix. Uh, these girls came from Texas, as you can see. You can stack them up like cordwood. They thought they had died and gone to heaven. Well, for about 30 days anyway, then they thought hell kind of caught up to them. The drought got to us. So again, intensity and diversity in your crops, in your cover crops, and in your livestock. Uh, and we went from two cash crops to 12. We've gone from monoculture cover crops to eight, nine, 10, 15 way mixes. Our cash crops are now polycultures. Our livestock are still mostly uh, cattle. But uh, Lynette's in a bit when you introduce chickens, uh, she's wanting to buy sheep. I look at pigs at some point in the future, so we're also going to get more diverse and more intense with our livestock. Uh, we've all done soil sampling. Uh, this year we did some biological sampling, and I think this is going to be the future. This is really going to change things. Uh, these two samples right here was the, the fields you've been seeing in my house where we have the corn. Uh, we've got a patch out there we've had yield problems for years. Uh, we had some low pH, we fixed that with lime, we didn't fix the yields. We pull soil samples every year. The fertility was always high, but that's kind of a duh, because the background's not gilding as much, so there's not as much fertility being used, so it's still there. 
So you pull a soil sample, what does it tell you? Well, it tells you there's fertility, but the plant's not using it for whatever reason. So we pulled biological samples. Now, I, I can't understand this, unfortunately, but I'm going to have to learn fast, but there are people that can explain this to us. And lo and behold, our microbial counts were almost half. For whatever reason, we've got some issue here that the microbes aren't very happy. And I, I think in the very, very near future, and I'm talking in the next few weeks or months, you're going to send in a sample, and they're going to send you back a prescription cover crop. As you can see here, the mycorrhiza is extremely low. So we're going to come in with some peas and things that are very mycorrhizal friendly next year and see if we can address this issue with that. This over here, by the way, is one of my brother's native hay meadows. This is one of the, probably the best hay meadows in our county. Um, he actually, it's on some flood grounds. He said some red clover got established into it after a flood, so there is a little diversity in this, which most of them do not have. And yet look at his counts in the native, as opposed to what we're doing in a cropping situation. Value of organic matter, 1% organic matter, 1,000 pounds of nitrogen. I think this is a little outdated. We probably add at least 10 or 15 cents to that today as nitrogen's gone up. Value of phosphorus, value of potassium, sulfur, carbon, $680 per acre <coughs> per percent. Most of my organic matter now is in the four range. And we're not even addressing micronutrients here. And I have to throw this one in for Josh. We went to a holistic training seminar. I got my first round of training in last year. And Josh challenged everybody in the room. How many of you are no-tilling your garden? Here's my garden, Josh. This is what it looked like last year. And just to prove that this wasn't just a cover crop, there's one of our raspberries. And there's my, uh, I think those were peppers, I'm not sure. And there's our lettuce. And uh, by the way, about, it was the last Sunday, we had a lettuce, uh, mixed lettuce salad with our meal. We were still picking out of our garden. And up a month ago, we were still picking carrots, turnips, radishes out of our garden. Limitations, until you spread your wings, you'll have no idea how far you can walk. <laughs> <laughs> and I'd rather be a failure at something I love than a success at something I hate. With that, thank you. And I'll hand it back over to